And if it needs defending, we'll always rise to the challenge. Speaking of which... The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are dead. Long live the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles has come to an end, and the heroes in a half shell are once again poised to reinvent themselves. The series was perhaps too radical of a departure for the Ninja Teens. Its Sakuga-style animation could make Studio Trigger salivate, but some fans just couldn't appreciate the show's focus on magic and mysticism. As for myself, well, any project that puts food on John Cena's table is okay in my book. And besides, old school purists are eaten right now. The success of Shredder's Revenge and the dream come true that is the Cowabunga Collection are so deeply ensconced in the 80s era, they should open with the FHE logo. The Turtles are currently wrapped in a cocoon of nostalgia as the Rise era transforms into something new. Rise was a big swing from a franchise that is no stranger to them. And there's a lot we can learn from how the Ninja Turtles have thrived for 40 years, long after the original fad faded. <laughs> Took you guys long enough. <laughs> Unlike the boardroom-driven He-Man, Transformers, and G.I. Joes of the 80s, the Turtles are the product of just two people dorky New England dudes, Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. As their success grew, their creative partnership became strained. They struggled to publish their hit comic book while simultaneously shepherding it into a global phenomenon. By 1987, they were just sick of working with each other. Eastman and Laird both mark issue 11, the post-defeat retreat into the woods that's been adapted across nearly all turtle incarnations, as the last time they were ever fully on the same page as writers and artists. They stopped creating, but they'd keep on curating the Turtles together, even though Eastman's heart was no longer in it. After a falling out amid the disastrous Next Mutation show, Eastman sold his share to Laird, leaving him to lead with his own vision. Known as the Four Kids or 2003 series in shorthand, the new cartoon made a serious attempt to capture the story and spirit of the original comics, to the point of adapting entire Eastman and Laird issues. Though the show wasn't afraid to shake things up either, like controversially merging Krang and Shredder into one evil Utron. Laird was deeply involved in the 2003 series. He approved scripts and character designs and gave a whole lot of notes. You can even read a bunch of them on his blog and be thankful he's not your editor. His feedback helped make a fantastic series, even if it did get a little bit too toyetic towards the end. And when it was over, Laird 2 found himself finished with the fearsome fighting team. He sold his stake to Nickelodeon slash Viacom in 2009, retaining only the rights to publish 18 black and white comics set in his original continuity. I wouldn't hold my breath. But just as Laird was done with the Turtles, Eastman found his way back from the sewers, his fondness for his co-creation reignited. In 2011, he began working on a Turtles comic for IDW, writing, plotting, and contributing his charismatic and charmingly crude art. Eastman helped kickstart an awesome 100-plus issue run that's nearly unheard of for a modern licensed comic book. In 2020, Eastman released The Last Ronin, a Frank Malarian cyberpunk opera starring the last living turtle in a most bogus future dystopia. The idea was based on a pitch he and Laird typed up back in 1987, right after they finished issue 11. And Eastman, along with writer Tom Waltz, expanded it with the former partner's blessing. So, Eastman and Laird have largely left the picture, but intellectual property marches on. How have the new corporate overlords treated the turtles? The results so far have been a mixed bag, but Viacom's various versions have helped the franchise evolve through experimentations. Riding the tides of trends and tastes has left the TMNT well-suited for a successful future. Eastman and Laird's original comics were black and white, emblematic of the self-published indie scene from which they emerged. On the rare occasion the Turtles were seen in color, they each wore identical red bandanas. Leonardo, Michelangelo, Donatello, and Raphael could only be distinguished by their signature weapons. Playmates Toys came up with the Turtles' trademark colors, along with their passion for pizza, How about lunch? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. and personalities broad enough to fit inside a single stanza of the theme song. And that's more or less where they stayed throughout the entire independent era. The 90s movies offer more muted versions in revolutionary rubber suits. The 2003 series gave the boys a makeover, inspired by Bruce Timm's streamlined style. 
The comics dabbled in Cyborg Donnies and Limbless Leos, but for the most part, the Turtles remained four identical green humanoids who all wear the same outfits, even when they're in disguise. One's rude, one leads, one parties, one does machines, and that's pretty much all we got for 20 or so years. When Viacom bought the franchise, that began to change. The 2012 series was a throwback to the classic era in a lot of ways. Now that one corporation owned everything Turtles, elements from the 80s were brought back into the fold, from Bebop and Rocksteady to the Mighty Mutanimals. But for all the colorful mutants and spiritual shoutouts, it was clear that these Turtles were trying to appeal to a new audience. For one thing, the show was now computer animated, much improved from their last CG outing in the unremarkable 2007 film TMNT. The new style was not without controversy, especially when fans found out that the boys now had three toes, a decision that was treated as borderline blasphemous in certain turtle circles. The designers of the 2012 series also took the opportunity to further differentiate the brothers. For the first time, the Ninja Turtles all had different eye colors and unique body attributes. Michelangelo is the shortest, with a childlike face and freckles. Donatello is tall and skinny, with a gap in his front teeth. It's subtle, but the differences are there, and they would only grow as time marched on. More obvious are the personality changes. Befitting their new home on Nickelodeon, these turtles are depicted as 15-year-old kids, equally obsessed with crappy cartoons as they are with kicking shell. The supporting cast was aged down as well, with a teenage April O'Neil coming into her own as a ninja warrior. 2012 also played up romance and relationships, which helped it amass a large following of teens on Tumblr, who latched onto ships like Leo slash Karai and the iconic, problematic April Tello. Simultaneously with their small screen shenanigans, the Turtles returned to the cinema in two Michael Bay produced blockbusters. Early in development, fans learned through leaked scripts that the Ninja Turtles were no longer teenage mutants. Instead, they were reimagined as members of an alien race battling an evil American arms dealer named Colonel Schrader. The changes were met with considerable fanboy rage and eventually walked back to a more traditional depiction, but it was early evidence that Viacom was more than willing to experiment with their new toys. The character designs were certainly a departure from the norm, expanding on the diverse body types of the 2012 series while adding armor, tchotchkes, and other decorations to make each turtle more unique. Unfortunately, like Bay's Transformers, the busy designs all seem to blend together in a swirling miasma of bad CGI. 2018's Rise is where they finally got it right. We're like nothing you've ever seen. Yeah! For the first time, the brothers were explicitly different species of turtles and designed as such, with distinctive silhouettes setting them apart. The boys are all different ages, and Raph, now the oldest, is the leader. They received new weapons and powers suitable for fighting evil alchemists and mystical yokai. Nostalgia was kept to a minimum. Fresh characters were introduced left and right, and for the first time it felt like the Ninja Turtles were going someplace new. Maybe too new. A little too Raph. You guys, back it off. Rise of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was canceled after just two seasons and an excellent straight-to-streaming film. If this isn't the poster shot, someone's getting fired. But it's not like the franchise itself is failing, given the smash hit Shredder's Revenge and the comprehensive Cowabunga collection. Fans might not have been ready for such big changes, but in 10 years you'll almost certainly see new Turtles obsessives who first met the TMNT through Rise. As for what's next, we don't know much about Seth Rogen's animated film Mutant Mayhem. Pre-release materials have a sort of Big Daddy Roth meets Middle School Notebook aesthetic, meaning we'll probably see a renewed focus on the Turtles as rowdy teens. I imagine Viacom will continue the trend of diversifying their looks and characterizations, and we might even see the long-awaited fifth Turtle make her presence known. I was schooled in the internal art and raised to replace him as a master shaman someday. Personally, I wouldn't be too surprised to see some Spider-Verse-style multiversal shenanigans, even though the Turtles were pulling that off years before Miles Morales was even created. But no matter what the new Turtles look like, no matter who they are or how they came to be, two things will be true. They'll be just as valid as every other incarnation, and they will not be the last.